You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Welcome to this another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs, and I'm so thankful to be with you, so thankful for this opportunity to open up God's Word and to spend time studying more about the Book of God. We've been studying about the Holy Spirit in the last few episodes, and we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, who He is, and we talked about some of the things the Holy Spirit does and has done so far as uh, creation, so far as inspiration, and so far as salvation. And so I thought it would be good for us to continue in this study looking specifically at the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you look into your Bibles, you're going to read about the Holy Spirit and, and some of the miraculous gifts that he has imparted or has given to man for various reasons and the way he gave to men back in the first century. And so we're going to be looking at some of that. And as always, we want to encourage you to open your Bible and follow along with what we have to study. It's so imperative that we, that we open our Bibles and read and study along together because I want you to understand the things we're saying is not come from my mind. It's not my invention. It's not the invention of the Southside Church of Christ. It's not that kind of thing at all. But rather, it's things we read within the Bible, within Scripture. That's what we're reading. We're just going to open up God's Word. Just read it. We'll be able to put our finger on the verse. If you'll follow along, we'll put our fingers right on the verse and read it together. So we know just exactly what God expects. And we know exactly what God has described. If you'd like to have a Bible study together on this subject or any other Bible-related subject, what you have to do is contact us. We'd be glad to set up a Bible study with you. We can come to your house. You can come to our house. We'd love to spend time in the study of God's Word. Or if you'd like to have a correspondence course or other things of that nature, just contact us. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you. You can write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road here in Owensboro. Zip code is 42303. And just write... Uh, you know, address that in care of the ancient landmark. If you'd like to call us, you can call 683-5386. And if you want to talk about Bible matters and Bible subjects, we're certainly glad to talk about those things and to study with you from the book of God. Make sure and, and let us know about that. We want to know about, about you and about what your, the, the interest you have in the Bible that we might all help each other, that we might listen to God's Word, and that we might all be able to go to heaven. And so that being the case, even if you see me out in different places, uh, you're not going to bother me. You're not going to make me upset if you come up and say hi, if you want to ask a Bible question, whatever. You just want to say maybe that you've been watching. I'd love to know about folks who are watching the program. Uh, whatever the case is, I hope this is beneficial to you and hope it helps you in your study of the book of God. But again, we, we think about the Holy Spirit. And what's so sad is that the Holy Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit and all, is such a controversial subject. And it's very controversial primarily because, I believe primarily because uh, people just don't know. They're not studying like they should. They're not listening to what the Book of God has to say. If you talk to some folks, they might have the idea that the Holy Spirit just barely talked about in the Bible. And yet, if you open your Bibles and start in Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, you're going to read about the Holy Spirit in num numerous places. Just all through, as we've talked about already, through Revelation and through Inspiration and through Creation and through Salvation, you're going to read about the Holy Spirit's work and role and all of that. And so it should come as no surprise then that after Christ has come to this earth, after He has died on the cross, after He has resurrected from the dead, that Jesus would then promise uh, there, and the fulfillment rather of that promise being, the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit is with the apostles. Now that was a promise Jesus made before His crucifixion in John 14, John 15, and John 16. And He said, I'm going away, but I'm going to send another comforter. And he goes on and says, the Comforter, who is the Holy Spirit, is going to be here with you. And he's going to remind you of things. He's going to show you things to come. He said, there's many things I have, I'd like to tell you that I'm not able to tell you right now. But when he, the Holy Spirit has come, he'll guide you into all truth. And he said, that's what's going to happen. And so sure enough, after the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, here we see the Holy Spirit uh, and His promised work. 
And one of the ways that his promised work is being accomplished is through miraculous gifts, miraculous abilities that were given to various ones, and including the apostles. And also we're going to see that even it was given to individual Christians, this uh, symbol of powers were given to individual Christians there throughout the first century. And so if you will, what I want to start with is describing these gifts. We're going to let the Bible describe these gifts. We're going to look at the descriptions of these gifts and then we'll move on from there. First of all, we begin in Mark 16. Mark 16, uh, here's Jesus speaking, the Bible says, to the eleven. This is Mark 16 and verse 14. Jesus is speaking to the eleven. Why eleven? Well, by this time Judas has killed himself. So now there's eleven instead of twelve. So here he is speaking to the eleven and talking to them. And as he goes on and, and speaks these familiar words to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. After this, in verse 17, he says, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And verse 19 then says, The Lord, after he had spoken unto them, what he was received up into heaven, sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth. Verse 20, they. The they are the eleven at this point. They went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now, in other words, what Jesus had said in Mark 16 verse 14 down about through verse 18 where he said, you need to go preach the gospel to every creature. You need to tell him, he believes and baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. And talked about miraculous signs, miraculous gifts that's going to be present. It then says, verse 19 and verse 20, basically, that's exactly what they did. They went out from that place. They preached the word. And as they went preaching the gospel, preaching the word, it says that the Lord was with them and confirmed the word with signs following. In other words, the very signs that were just described in that very verse, verse 17 and 18, they're doing. And so you, you read about this. You read about these miraculous gifts. Now, just hold your finger right there and turn to 1 Corinthians 12. Okay? We're in Mark chapter 16. I understand that, but jump to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 real quick, and we're going to see something else. We want to see something in relation to these spiritual gifts once more. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 it talks about the, the spiritual gifts and he says that these things were given by the same Spirit, in fact. In, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's start in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. Uh, and by the way, right there shows you the Spirit and Jesus Christ the Lord and God the Father. And that goes back to another study we've had uh, concerning the Holy Spirit being deity. And right there in the same with the Godhood or Godhead, uh, they're all three, hope God... The Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, all together deity. And there it is described with us. He says you've got diversity gifts, the same Spirit. Diversity of operation, the same God. And the difference of administration, the same Lord. And so here's the, here's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit again. Well, moving on. He says then, in verse 7, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every uh, man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now here's where we get into these gifts. He said there's one that's given the word of wisdom. To another, he says, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But he says, but all these work that one and the self same Spirit divine uh, every man severally as he will, and go in, and he goes on from there. But what we're seeing is this: we're seeing the description of the miraculous gifts that Christians have at this time, and we'll get into some of this in more detail about how they got it and so forth. You stay with our study; and we'll continue. But I want us to I want us to go methodically about this and notice. 
first of all, the descriptions of these gifts. He said there's folks who's going to cast out devils. You go back to Mark 16 for a moment. He said there's going to be folks cast out devils. He said there's going to be people who, among other things, he says, they're going to not only cast out devils, they're going to speak with new tongues. Now that term tongue, we'll find in Acts chapter 2, means a language. He's not talking about new tongue and just saying whatever. Uh, it wasn't something where people get in some ecstatic utterances and so forth and they begin to you know, babble like a baby and mumble like a monkey and chatter like a chimp. That's not what's going on. But they're speaking in new languages. In other words, new to them. And so that's why in Acts chapter 2 they could listen to these apostles speak and they said, how can we hear every man speak in the language wherein we were born? Well, it's because they had the ability given by the Holy Spirit and promised in Mark 16 and now they are they're just practicing or utilizing the gift. Okay? So there's other things. Well, continue reading. What else did he say? He said you can take up serpents. You can take up serpents. And a serpent comes and, and whatever, maybe tries to hurt them, whatever. Well, that won't happen. Drink any deadly thing. The ability to ingest poisons and so forth. And it's not going to hurt you. He says, uh, if you lay the hands on sick, they're going to recover. And uh, things like that. You're going to heal the sick people. You see that? You're just, you're just reading Mark 16, verse 17, verse 18. And what's interesting to note is, about any of these things we're talking about, you're going to find examples of this by one or more apostles doing it. And that's why I said what Mark 16, 17, and 18 was said was miraculous gifts of the Spirit, miraculous abilities the Spirit has given, but it is something he was speaking to the apostles about. That they would have that kind of ability. And like I said, as you go through the book of Acts in particular, you're going to see where uh, folks were doing those very things. The apostles were doing that. Okay? And uh, we'll get into some of that as we move along. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 then talks about also about miraculous gifts that, that folks had the ability to have. These Christians had this ability, these various abilities. And he said, there are some people who had the word of wisdom. And that's 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 8. In other words, the oral proclamation of the wisdom. In other words, wisdom, it came from God. They didn't study it in a school. They didn't learn it from someone else. It wasn't their own personal study that brought them to this point. But rather, it's miraculous in nature. He goes on and talks about the word of knowledge. Well, again, knowing the truth of God without study. And so now we're talking about knowing God's truth. They didn't have to study. Uh, in fact, you know, they, they couldn't study, really, because the Bible wasn't in its completed form. They couldn't study the whole thing. But if some Christian had that word of knowledge, that ability, they were able to know God's word. They were able to know what the truth is. And that's what we find here. We keep on reading. Not only was it those things, but also we find that after <coughs> talking about the word of knowledge, wisdom, the word of knowledge, he talks about faith. Now we read about faith in Romans 10, 17. That faith comes by hearing the word of God. Now this is not that kind of faith, but rather a supernatural kind of faith. A, a mir very miraculous type of faith is what's under consideration here. Healing, the ability to heal people. They could, whatever they needed to do, touch them or whatever it was they would do, and they could recover people, heal people, and you find that happening on numerous occasions. Just beautiful things going on. Now there's a reason for it, we'll get into all the reasons, but just notice how this comes about. Not only healing, but keep reading with me. Healing, he says, another working of miracles. Miraculous abilities, of course. Uh, supernatural feats that were going on. Prophecy, the ability to be God's mouthpiece, God's spokesman there to, to speak the word of God to people. Uh, he talks about discerning spirits. Discerning spirits is the ability to know the difference between truth and error, between true teachers and false teachers. Now again, we go back to the, to the days of the first century. Remember, the Word of God wasn't in its completed form then. Now today, if someone says whatever, if they say something, they claim it's from God or they claim it's God's will, 
you and I can go and say, well, now wait a minute, we need to look this up in the Scripture, and let's find out where that says that, and then we'll talk. On the first century, you couldn't do that. You didn't have the, the written word like that. And it was still in its writing stage, if you will. Folks were still writing it down, like, uh, you know, Paul and Peter and James and Jude and Matthew, Mark and Luke and John and all, they're still doing their thing, writing, and so they don't have everything. So someone would have that ability to discern spirits. He talks about diverse kinds of tongues. And again, speaking different languages. That's going to be handy whenever someone, even, they're not a, a, an apostle, but someone who is a Christian, and they go in, into some land to preach the gospel, and they need to, the ability to speak the language in, the, in that foreign language. And they would have that ability. There it is. It's a speaking of tongues, speaking of a language, an earth language. And folks had that ability. Now the apostles did, but also you're seeing overlap, aren't you? You're seeing some things the apostles did, but there's also overlap with some things that the Christians could do all throughout the first century and all through that time, so long as they were living. And you go on, he says not only that, but interpretation of tongues. Alright, the ability to interpret what's said. Somebody is speaking in a certain language and the folks don't know that language, you can interpret and tell them what he's saying. That's all that has to do. Or it could be that you have someone from a foreign land. Interpretation of tongues would be such that if you had someone from a foreign land, foreign born, speaking a foreign language that comes to you and you'd have the ability to, turn, to interpret and know what that person's saying. That'd be a good thing to have, wouldn't it? See, those are the kind of abilities. Those are the kind of things that were there, that they had at this time. They didn't study those languages, but God gave them that miraculous ability to know still what the languages were or know what the miracles were and so forth. So that's what they had. And this list, uh, not in 1 Corinthians 12, but also Mark 16, lists those miraculous gifts and miraculous abilities that different ones had, whether it was apostles, whether it was the Christians, or whether sometimes, like we've noticed, some things kind of overlap between both groups of people. Not everything did, but some things did. And so, some people would be, uh, either one might be performing that miraculous gift. Now, how were these gifts imparted? In other words, how would they get those? How did you get this ability? Now, if we listen to some people, we might think that the Holy Spirit just fell on everybody all the time. You know, if you listen to some folks, you might have that impression that the Holy Spirit just came, just any time something's going on, any time you had Christians somewhere, the Holy Spirit just fallen all over the place, and there they were. But folks, that's not what happened. When we studied together the other day, in an, in an earlier episode, and by the way, any of these episodes, if you just request them, you can have them for yourself, but in an earlier episode, we studied how it was that this happened. Here's Jesus in John 14, 15, and 16 promising the apostles, not anyone else, promising the apostles that the Holy Spirit would come on them. And that's exactly what happened. And the Holy Spirit fell on them in Acts 2. When you go to Acts 2, the first four verses, and read about it. That's exactly what happened. He said, the Holy Spirit's going to fall on you. And sure enough, it did, and they were baptized, if you will. They were immersed, they were overwhelmed, covered by the Holy Spirit. And that's what we find. And there imparted those abilities. And, and then you see the practice of those. We're going to look at those as well. But it's not like the Holy Spirit just fell on everybody all the time. It wasn't like it was just in every single case. Somebody said, well, how do you know? I know because the Bible talks about what happened. And it wasn't in every case of conversion that this went on. It was a very specific, special case. In fact, it was such an earth-shattering event that it required the Holy Spirit to be there. And that was in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 when you read about the conversion of Cornelius the Gentile. That was such an earth-shattering event to the Jews at that time to consider a Gentile being uh, allowed, if you will, being uh, uh, given the opportunity to hear the gospel, to believe it, and to obey it, it was such an earth-shattering event 
that the Holy Spirit fell upon those folks. Hebrews, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 11, Acts 11, and Acts chapter 11, there he says, it happened as I began to speak. In other words, just as he starts preaching, just as he starts speaking the word, Peter does, the Holy Spirit falls on these folks, and he realizes this being the case, who am I to withstand God? And in the people who hear that, go to Acts 11, 18. Those who heard Peter, those who gave him such a hard time, verse 1, those who were so adamant against what he had done, whenever they heard what went on, and they understood what had happened, they said, we understand now God has granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. They said, we understand now God's intention was for the Gentiles to be granted repentance unto life. Now that's the only time you read about them in the Bible. The Holy Spirit didn't fall on people all the time. It just didn't happen. It doesn't happen today. Despite uh, protests to the contrary, folks, it's not happening. And there's a number of reasons why that's so. And we'll get to those as, the, as our study continues. But we need to understand that it happened in Acts chapter 2. It happened in Acts chapter 10. And never again in the entire New Testament did it happen. And then people were not imparted with miraculous gifts in that way. This just wasn't done. Somebody said, well, how do you know? I know because it never talked about it anymore. But I tell you what is talked about. When Christians received the gift of the Holy Spirit, it came by the laying on of hands by the apostles. And you kind of get a picture of that a little bit in 1 Corinthians 12, don't you? Where he said, all these uh, work that one same self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. In other words, what he's saying is, all of the spiritual gifts we're talking about came from the same spirit, but everybody's getting one gift. And it's divided as he will. In other words, as the spirit wills. And so it wasn't as if someone, let's say John, John here was baptized into Christ at Corinth, and John came up, you know, to, to the Apostle Paul and, and said, you know, I'd really like to have the gift of prophecy. And then he said, well, here you go, you can have it. That wasn't what happened. Uh, if John at Corinth gets a gift, any gift, it's because that's what was given to him, not because he chose it. And so that's what we find. Now, how was that given? Well, I've already given you an example. He laid on the apostles, laid their hands on people. And that's how it came about. Over the book of Acts chapter 8 describes this event very well. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip the evangelist, not the apostle Philip, Philip the evangelist, goes to Samaria and preaches the gospel. But it says that he went there, verse 5 and also verse 12, and as a result of preaching the gospel, he preached in the name of Jesus Christ, and the kingdom of God, and he said they were baptized, both men and women. Simon believed also, and he was baptized. And so you have these folks here who heard God's word, believed and were baptized. But now we find that, that having this uh, happen, that word reaches Jerusalem. And said so these folks of Samaria baptized, the whole city's come out, it's just fantastic. Wonderful things happening down here, and you need to know about it. Well, then uh, those folks said Peter and John, John, Peter and John went down to Samaria. And whenever they went there, they laid hands on people, the Bible says. They laid hands on them because it says, verse 16, he had fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. What has happened? He said, Well, all of them have been baptized. In the name of Christ, in other words, all men baptized for the remission of sins, just as been taught in Acts 2. And just as been taught in Mark 16, 16, and everywhere else, he says that that's happened. But the Holy Spirit has not been given to anyone. So Peter and John come down, the Bible says, and lay hands on people. And when they lay hands on people, he said that's the time that they receive the Holy Ghost, that they receive these gifts. And that's what happened. Timothy was another one uh, in this category. He talks about how that Timothy had this gifts imparted to him, and he said, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which is given to thee by laying on the hands of presbytery. He says, Do not neglect the gift you have. And so here are just different examples of where 
uh, folks received the miraculous powers of the Holy Spirit. But how it was done was not the Holy Spirit baptism on somebody, but by the apostles laying their hands on people. And when the apostles did this, that's when they received whatever gift that might have been, whether it be tongue speaking or prophecy or miracles or whatever, the, whatever it was, uh, they're listed for us in 1 Corinthians 12. Now that's what happened. And as we see here, folks, all we're doing, somebody says, I've never heard anything like this before. Well, I don't know what to tell you other than just read the Bible. We're just reading together. All we've read was Mark 16, and then we read 1 Corinthians 12, and now we're reading Acts 8. All we're doing is just reading these verses and putting them in their logical order. Oh yeah, Acts chapter 9, or 10 and 11, didn't we? And so with that, all that, that's all we're doing, really, isn't it? I mean, that's what we're seeing. And so we see not only the description of the various gifts, we see how, the, how this gift was imparted to people. And so down with the idea that says, well, that people have miraculous spiritual gifts today, did an apostle lay his hands on you? I mean, that's one question. I mean, someone says, no, I just got it, I just got it one day. No, you didn't. The apostle had to lay hands on you in order for you to get it. That's the only way, and that's how it happened in the first century. Thus, at the death of the apostles, no one else could get any more gifts after that. And so, they would go away finally. Those are things for you to consider. We're going to take a break right now, and we'll come back and consider some more about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. So you stay tuned. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our web address at www.southside-churchofchrist.com Our Sunday Bible class is at 9.30 a.m. Sunday worship services are at 10.20 a.m. and at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes are at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Make sure to tune in to our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark airing daily, Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Thursdays at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. A question at this time concerns the Ark of the Covenant. Specifically asking the question, where did the Ark go? You know, uh, unlike popular belief, Indiana Jones didn't find the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, in fact, uh, we don't know where it is. You know, whenever you begin to read the scripture, you find that the ark was given, uh, the plans for the ark were given by God uh, there to the people back in the book of Exodus. There in, in conjunction with the giving of the law and all that, so also there was the plans for the tabernacle, making of the furniture that would be in there, the table for showbread, the lampstand, the uh, altar of incense and so forth and also this Ark of the Covenant which in simple terms what it amounted to was just a big box and the big box that held the tablets of stone and, and held uh, Aaron's rod that budded and, and held uh, an amount of manna there 
and there it was on the top of it was the mercy seat where the two angels were facing one another and, and there that was set into the to the most holy place or the holy of holies first of all within the tabernacle and then later on it would be there set within the temple Solomon there made the temple in the book of Kings and there those things that, that was set and every year the priest the high priest would go in with blood and there having offered the incense there and the smoke of the incense going through the curtain and through the veil there before that place then the uh, high priest would walk in with blood and take the blood of sprinkling and put it all over now that's what you find that's the description of what's going on in the old testament the ark was taken in, into battle the ark of the covenant was was used and carried by folks on stage or long rods and they'd carry that around but what we find is that in the book of 1 Kings, the last chapter of 1 Kings, we read about how the Babylon came and took away all the goods, the treasures, and everything there from, uh, from the king, from Jerusalem there at that time. Babylon comes down, and in fact, the Bible says that those things were taken away, and they're kept by, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. Whenever you look in the book of Ezra, we find where they returned, the people returned. Ezra chapter 1 and then Ezra chapter 5 is a detailed rendering of the things that were brought back, the various cups and vessels and other things like that, brought there uh, to brought there to Jerusalem. Conspicuously absent from that list is the Ark of the Covenant. Conspicuously absent from that list are the lampstands and the table showbread and so forth. And that talks about vessels and cups and various things like this, but none of those things were mentioned. Now, secular history tells us and gives us an impression that perhaps Titus got a hold of it somehow or another. Titus, uh, the, uh, the son of the emperor, uh, there about 70 AD, whenever they came in uh, and Rome destroyed Jerusalem, that there uh, and, and you can see this today there in the in the carving or the uh, there the sculpture there of the uh, arch of the victory arch there that they had at Rome was supposed to be a, a sculpture or a carving where Titus and all the armies come in with the lampstands and the Ark of the Covenant and so forth and carried it into Rome there in victory after having destroyed the temple and after having destroyed Jerusalem and the records and all such. But really what's interesting is you don't read about the Ark of the Covenant being in existence in the time of Christ. You look in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see if there's any references to the Ark of the Covenant. It's not there. So what happened to the Ark? I don't know. And I don't have any way of knowing for sure. I do know that whenever it was used and used in God's purpose, God used it, it was there, it served its purpose, and when it was over it was done. You know, God does that with a lot of things. He did that with the ark, Noah's ark. It was there for a time, used for its purpose. Whenever it's done, it's done and over with. You don't know where the ark is. People claim to know. They don't know where it is. The ark of the covenant's that way, and many other things are that way. When it was used and it was done, God was through with it. God is no pack rat. Hebrews chapter 1 tells us one day this earth is going to be destroyed. Whenever this earth is destroyed, he's going to take it. It's going to be used up, done, folded up, as it were, folded up, put away. It's going to be over. And that's what God, uh, had, had, how God has always been. And so the thing for us to do is not get so caught up and worried about where the Ark of the Covenant is. Our concern is to be uh, whether or not we are right in the sight of God, whether or not we are what we need to be before God, and prepare for the time when God is through with this earth. And we're back again. We want to continue in our study of the book of God. We've been looking at the Holy Spirit, studying about the Holy Spirit specifically, about the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so you go ahead and get a Bible out. If you didn't get one, get one now and follow along as we're studying. Feel free to take any notes you'd like to take as we continue in this study. Because we've looked at uh, the specific gifts that are named uh, there in Mark 16 and also 1 Corinthians 12. We've talked about how they're imparted or given to folks. 
and it was by the laying on of the apostles' hands. They're just That's just what is described right there for us in Acts chapter 8. And we know that it is through the apostles' hands and not just anyone, because remember now in Acts chapter 8, when Philip goes to Samaria and preaches the gospel, and those folks hear God's word, they believe and they're baptized. But Philip does not impart any gifts to them. Why not? Why didn't Philip do it? Why didn't he lay hands on people and there uh, give them whatever gift is, you know, through the Holy Spirit, whatever gift they need? Well, because he can't do it. He doesn't have that ability. He doesn't have that, that uh, power to uh, do that. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, as you continue to read, you're going to see where Simon the sorcerer comes. And he, he wants this gift. But what he does is he goes to Peter. Now why did he go to Peter, not Philip? Mm -hmm. Because he understood who was given the gift. So he goes to Peter and he, and he offers him money to, that, to give him that power, he said, so that whoever I lay my hands on, I can give them the gift too. And so he's trying to bribe Peter into giving him that ability, that power, that belonged to the apostles. And of course he's condemned for that and told he needs to repent and so forth. But please understand, we, we see here that Simon himself recognized who had that ability and it wasn't Philip. And so he goes to the one that has the ability and there tries to bribe him into getting that ability to lay hands on folks and then they would have the whatever spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit allowed them to have. And so in that... Um, in that first century, the way that gift was given to folks was by and through the laying on of the apostles' hands. And that's it. And that's why I said folks today who claim to have some sort of miraculous power and claim to have some sort of miraculous gift, I know that they don't have it. There's no way they do. They never had it, never will have it, never did have it. Because the, whole, the apostles had to lay hands on people in order to give that, holy, that, holy, that miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. They had to have the laying on of hands by the apostles. And that hadn't been done because the twelve apostles all died in the first century. John, the oldest living apostle at the time, lived up into the late 90s, perhaps as late as 100 AD. But then he dies an old man. He's the only one that does so. And so there, there's no more apostles around to do it anyways. And so the last, then, then that generation, of course, that, that might live on after John or after any of the, these apostles, any of those uh, perhaps younger people, whatever, perhaps they lived into the second century with this ability, and then after that it's gone. It doesn't go on, and for generation after generation after generation, it's not passed down through the years. And not all that, because it was given by the apostles, and that's it. Somebody says, well, how do you know that? I know, because that's what the Bible shows. That's what the Bible teaches. We've proven that already earlier. But look, and consistently through the Scriptures, that's what was going on. And so, though the apostles had that ability. Now, when we think about the power of the, the Holy Spirit, when we think about the miraculous gifts... What was the purpose of those gifts? Now that would be an important thing to learn also. Because if I know what the purpose of these miraculous gifts are, then I'll know what, they're, what they were doing with them or what their purpose was behind that. Well, consistently throughout Scripture we find that the purpose of miraculous gifts was that they would cause folks to believe. That's what it was. Even if you go back in Old Testament days, and I recognize that it's not called the gift of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament days, I understand that, but there were still folks with the ability to perform miracles in Old Testament times. When they did that, when they performed those miracles, when they acted in that way, the purpose was so that people might believe that they were who they said they were, that they might believe the truth. This was a badge of authority, if you will, this was an ability given to them so that folks would believe that the ones performing miracles are telling the truth. You go into the New Testament times, even with Jesus, in John chapter 2, talks about even after his first miracle, there was many who believed on him when they saw the miracle. Later on, you're going to see that, uh, I mean, it just consistently. Later on in all those other miracles Jesus performed, you're going to find folks who believe on Christ 
They believe in him. They believe he is who he said he is because they saw all those miracles. Well, it's no different when you look to the apostles who had the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. It's no different with those folks because, again, folks believe in what they were saying. They believe they were telling the truth. And you see this over and over again. Yeah, and I'll give you a few examples just, just to show you that this is what's going on. For example, if you look over the book of Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 16, and Acts chapter 16 and verse 17, this is one example where the apostle Paul cast out a demon out of somebody. And first, I'm sorry, in the book of Acts 16, and Acts 16 and verse 17. Remember what, he's, what happened there whenever the apostle Paul and some others, and Luke and some others are all there in uh, uh, Paul and Silas and all, they have gone into Philippi. And going into Philippi, the Bible says that whenever he got there, there was this girl that was possessed with demons. And now there were those who owned her, she was a slave. There were those who owned her that made a lot of money out of her, about a fortune teller, like a fortune teller would be, because of her demon. Well, whenever Paul and Silas get into town, then the Bible says that this girl came up and she was saying and telling folks that uh, you know these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show thee the way of salvation. She did that for many days. Many days, it says, where she was following them and saying all this. And so finally, Apostle Paul got tired of it. He grieved and turned around and cast that demon out of her. And whenever he'd cast the demon out of her, of course, she can't, you know, fortune tell anymore. She can't soothsay anymore. She can't do any of those things anymore. And so those men are mad at her because of what, or mad, not mad at her, but mad at Paul for what he did to her in casting out the demon. Now, if you go back to Mark 16, verse 17, what did Jesus say the apostles were going to do? Mark chapter 16, verse 17 says, among other things, you're going to cast out demons. Well, the promise of Christ in Mark 16 to cast out demons was fulfilled on this occasion for sure, and, and certainly other, other times, but fulfilled on this occasion for sure when you have the Apostle Paul casting out the demon out of that girl. Further, are you still in the book of Acts? Turn with me now in the book of Acts and look, turn to the book of Acts 28. In Acts chapter 28 now. And you're going to see an occasion where, the, where here was the Apostle Paul again. Now we fast forward in time. He was going by boat, by the prison boat, going to Rome. Well, the boat had a, a shipwrecked. It crashed. And so now they've landed on an island. The Bible says in Acts 28 and verse 1, Melita. That's where they landed. That's where they came to. The Bible says that they went and in verse 3, when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. Well, what does that mean? Well, the viper came out. This poisonous snake came out and fastened on his hand. I wonder how a snake fastens on you. You know how a snake fastens on you. It came out and bit him and held on and clung to it, <clears throat> fastened to it. Verse 4, When the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said to themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he has escaped the sea, yet the venge vengeance suffereth not to live. He shook off the beast in the fire, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked, and when he should have swollen, I was falling down dead. But after they great while he said they saw no harm come and they changed their minds and then they said he was a god and then then we'll go from there because he has to correct that too. But notice here what's happened. He says, "Here's this venomous beast. Here's this viper comes up and bites the apostle Paul on the hand. He fastens on him. He's, he threw the sticks on the fire and evidently didn't see that snake. Uh, it was so cold and of course how snakes do in the cold they grow dormant." And so he threw him on the fire. Well, the snake warmed up. When the snake warmed up, he launched out, bang, hits him in the hand, fastens to him, bites him. In. And so, Apostle Paul takes and shakes him off in the fire. Now, wasn't there something about Mark 16 about taking up serpents and all that? And sure enough, he says, when they did that, he felt 
no harm. He didn't even swell up when he was swollen. And then, keep reading. It says then further, in the same verse, <clears throat> came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of the fever and a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered and prayed to lay his hands on him and healed him. He healed him. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Mark 16, verse 18. There Jesus again promising the apostles that if there's some sick person, you'd be able to heal them. And so now he is fulfilling these roles. He's fulfilling these things. He has uh, had a snake bite him, you remember? He's cast out demons. He's now healed someone sick. And those are just a few of the things that were done right there in the first century. Now, what was the purpose? What was the reason behind it? What happened as a result? Well, the Bible says that as a result of these things, he said they believed. Those folks believed on him. They first thought he was a murderer. They thought he was something, you know, some kind of criminal was going on. Something was happening in his back. But then they changed their minds, didn't they? They changed. There was no other way to, to accept it, or to, to do it except accept it. They had to accept the facts. It's just like back over in Philippi. Whenever he cast out the demon of that girl that was in that girl, well, of course, the, the slave owners didn't like that at all, and they stirred up a big stink. But what happens is, as a result, there are folks who believe on him, and there's folks who believe, and they're baptized, and they're saved. And there was the beginnings of the church at Philippi. Now, now you look over here, and you see these folks, you see just time and time again where folks believe. That was the purpose. That's the reason for these miracles. It's not a sideshow. It's not to gain popularity. It's not just something we do just to show off. It's not something to say, look how great I am. And how many times, this is with one example in Acts 28, they said he's a God and he had to correct them on that. That's not the only time they called the Apostle Paul a God of some sort. And they had to say, listen, that's not me. That's not this. This is not me doing this. This is the power of God doing this. I am not a God. I am a man. And you need to believe and worship God. That's what they had to do. The Apostle Peter is the same way. You know, the Apostle Peter, he had abilities and powers, for sure, that were given to him by uh, the Holy Spirit, you remember. And so he has this power. Just a few examples. Acts chapter 9. Turn over to Acts chapter 9. That's, that's really the only place we'll look. There's two examples there. One of them is the healing of a man named Aeneas. In Acts chapter 9, the Bible says there was a man who was sick, he said, and he was, his name was Aeneas, sick of the palsy. He was paralyzed. And there was in the bed for eight years. And the Bible says that whenever he came, Peter came to him and told him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ makes thee whole. He said, Arise and make thy bed. And the man arose immediately. And then, he says, after that, he says the people believed when they saw Aeneas. Well, they believed. In other words, they believed the gospel. Now, how did that happen? Well, they saw Aeneas. Aeneas was an example, if you will. And Aeneas is living proof of the apostle's power. And now they see Aeneas. Well, they didn't just automatically become saved because they looked at a, at a man who was healed. That wasn't what saved them. What saved them was the belief or the faith in the gospel message and their obedience to it. Somebody says, well, how do you know that? I know that because Peter didn't change his message from Jerusalem there uh, to go to Aeneas' house. He didn't change the message and start preaching something else that he, from what he preached in Acts 2. Acts 2, he taught repent and be baptized. Acts chapter 4, he taught repent and be baptized. Acts chapter 3 also. Acts 2, he taught repent and be baptized. Acts 3, he taught repent and be baptized. Uh, here in Acts chapter 9, he's going to preach the same thing. He hadn't changed message. He didn't change the gospel because he was in another place. And so those folks believe that same message. That's the, folk, that's the point of it. And then you go on and you read about this woman named Dorcas or Tabitha and how that she had died. She, Peter didn't even know her. But the people there, the Bible says, uh, 
that Lydda was knighted Joplin, so he goes over toward Lydda. And there he goes that way, and sure enough, when he gets there, here's this lady, and she, uh, rather, Lydda was where Anais was, he goes to Joplin where the lady is. I'm getting my cities referred. But Lydda was where Anais was, you go to Joplin, Joplin's where the lady Dorcas was. And here's Dorcas or Tabitha dead. And they tell Peter about it. He goes in and tells her to rise up. He uh, gave her his hand, verse 41 of Acts 9, lifted her up. And it says, he called the saints and widows and presented her alive. And it was known throughout all the land, and many believed on the Lord. Verse 42. I mean they believed on the Lord. They believed on the Lord. They believed the Lord's message. Why, how come they, how come they believed the Lord's message? They believed it. Because of what Peter did in healing the woman. By the power of the Holy Spirit, she was healed, and many believed. They believed on the Lord. They believed the message. They believed the gospel that was preached, that was taught. That's the point. The purpose of miracles is so folks will believe. And they believe the truth. This was a badge, if you will, a stamp of authority, and that's what we find. Well, how long were these gifts to last? We've touched on this a little bit in looking in Acts chapter 8. Because in Acts chapter 8, it talks about the apostles having the ability to, to spread, if you will, or to pass this gift on to other people. Once the apostles are dead, then that's the end of that gift. Well, people say, I don't know about that. Well, that's the truth. And number two, you can see the duration of these gifts from 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 down through verse 13 talks about this as well. And in this tells, uh, begins talking about love and how what love does and the attributes and characteristics of love. But also he says that in verse 8, whether uh, charity or love does not fail. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. And this is just three examples of, of those spiritual gifts. And he talks about prophecies. He talks about tongue, the supernatural tongue speaking we talked about a while ago. And knowledge, supernatural knowledge. It's going to fail. It's going to cease. It's going to vanish away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part should be done away, he said. Somebody says, well, now, of course, that when that which is perfect has come, it'll go away. Now, and, and someone is going to say, well, I'm going to tell you what, preacher, the, that which is perfect, now that's Jesus. And so whenever that which is perfect has come, that which is probably done away, and so until Jesus comes back, we always have spiritual gifts. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? And I'm sorry to say a lot of people have fallen for that, but that's not what this verse is teaching. Don't forget the context of 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is set between chapters 12 and 14. We talk about 12 and 14 of Corinthians. We're talking about uh, spiritual gifts. So he didn't... Uh, and another thing... Well, just start there. We're talking about spiritual gifts. He didn't change horses somewhere and start talking about something else. Spiritual gifts are necessary. What rules us... He's telling the Corinthians, what rules us Corinthians is love. Now understand, love needs to be the overriding factor in all of this. Don't get jealous. Don't say you got something better than someone else. Don't be all of that. Love is the overriding theme of it all because it's going to go away. And once these gifts go away, what's left? Well now, by its faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. Why? Well, because those things will go away. Think about it. One day, faith will be no more. One day, hope will be no more. See that? One day, those things will be no more. Whenever you stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, faith goes away. That faith and trust is necessary now whenever you stand before and you do, that, that, that's done now. It's completed. Hope is an earnest expectation of something. I have a hope for heaven. But whenever I'm standing in the gates of glory, I don't hope for it anymore. Whenever I'm there and I see heaven in all its beauty and splendor, I'm not going to hope for it anymore. Hope gone away. 
The greatest of these is love because love abides. Love endures through it all. And I need to understand that today. You need to understand that today. These folks of the first century need to understand that love was that overriding theme. Then you go into chapter 14, which is the regulation of those spiritual gifts. And so when the duration of spiritual gifts, you look here and he says, listen, it's going away. And whenever that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. And again, we go back to someone says, it's Christ. No, in that context was Christ ever talked about, really. I understand that Jesus is, is, is in the Bible. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying in that verse, in that is, is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about Christ? Number two, was he talking about the second coming of Christ in that chapter? No. Wasn't talking about that at all. He was talking about spiritual gifts and love and all that. See, the word perfect means whole, completed, full-grown, mature, that kind of thing. It doesn't mean sinless. He's not saying when the sinless one comes. What he's saying is whenever that which is completed is come. Now we know in part. Now we prophesy in part. We know spiritual knowledge of what? Of God's Word and will. We prophesy in part. What do we speak about? God's Word and will. And it's in part right now. But when that which is full grown, mature, whole, completed, then the in part will be done away. Isn't it something that folks in the first century longed and pined and looked forward to the day when the Bible would be in its completed form and you'd have it all right there and have the ability to see it and see the whole picture. And here we are, 2,000 years removed from that, having within our possession the completed word, the completed thing, the whole thing, the thing for which first century Christians pined for and longed for, we have the whole thing, and then you have folks saying, you know, I'd really like to go back to the miracle days. Why would you want to go backwards? Why do you want to go back to the time when you didn't have it all? Why? When you have the whole thing right now. That's what he was promising. And whenever that which is perfect is come, that which is in part should be done away. Those Old Testament, or I'm sorry, those miraculous gifts of the New Testament had their purpose, had their reason, they were there for a time, and now they are gone. We have the completed word. We have the entire thing right here. And we need to be thankful to God that we live in a time and live in a country and live in a place where we can have, not only do we have the completed word, but we have access to it so easily. And we can have it in written form, you can have it on the computer, you can have it on CDs, tapes, you can have it on DVDs, you can have it all over the place. You can have it, MP3s and everything else. We have the completed word. What are you doing about it? Do you believe it? Those miracles serve their purpose. And I can read about the miracles and I trust the Bible is true and I know that it's saying the truth and telling me the truth about folks' miracles which causes me to believe because I'm worshiping and loving and, and, and following and obeying the same God they did and now I have the completed word that I can believe and I can obey and I can follow and it'll take me to heaven one day. What about you? Are you interested in that? I hope you are. Let's appreciate the duration of these spiritual gifts and what the Holy Spirit really did. It's an amazing thing. It's a wonderful thing when we see it in its context. So thankful for this time. and So thankful for our study together. And hope that this has been helpful to you. If you'd like to study together privately, let's talk about that. Contact us and let's study real soon together. As I said, let's talk. You see me in town, let's talk. Say hi and ask, ask your Bible questions. Let's discuss the Bible, and let's learn what God has to say. I'm so thankful that you're here, so thankful for this time, and so thankful for our opportunities to study. Lord willing, we'll have some more studies on the Holy Spirit coming up very soon. But until next time, Lord willing, we we'll bid you good day. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Tune in Monday through Friday for an in-depth study of God's Word. The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ.